before I begin reading with scripture, um, I'd just like to say thank you. Um, it's been a wonderful summer working with you and getting to know you all. Um, it can be kind of a weird thing being transplanted into a church uh, for just for 10 weeks, but you guys have welcomed me, and it's been a loving time. And you know this, but I've gotten to know your pastoral staff, and they are wonderful, wonderful people. Uh, very hardworking, and uh, I've really gotten to, to know them and appreciate them as well. Uh, it's been a wonderful summer, so I just wanted to say thank you for that. The reading for this morning is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. So then, remember that at one time, you Gentiles by birth, called the uncircumcision, by those who are called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall that is the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace and might reconcile both groups to God in one body. Through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it, so he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you are also built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. There's a lot in there this morning, isn't there? When I was younger, I had a baseball coach uh, who lived near my house, and he taught me how to pitch, taught me all about baseball. And we went fishing all the time, uh, and our families were close. We had a good time together. Um, my brother and I went over to his house after school, and we had lots of conversations about tons of different things. Um, but sometimes they'd turn to politics. And when they turned to politics, they got a little vicious. I disagreed with him on quite a few things. We just saw the world kind of in different ways. Um, and eventually it got to the point that I didn't want to talk to him anymore. It ruined that relationship. Have you ever noticed how much division and separation is in our lives? Have you ever stopped to think about how many ways that we create division between us and them? These can be lighthearted, joking differences, but they can also be very serious. We like to have teams to root for, political issues to fight for, and ways to say that we are right, and those people over there, they're wrong. There are the Democrats and the Republicans, Duke fans and UNC fans. <laughs> Catholics, Episcopalians, Methodists, and Baptists. You're either Ford or Chevy. You're either Mac or PC. You either watch Fox News, MSNBC, or CNN. And there are the weird people out there among us that watch BBC. I don't know what that's about. <laughs> <laughs> but we live in a very polarized society, don't we? Where we draw lines in the sand and create our side, us, and then the other side, them. And much of our world plays off of these divisions. Some of these divisions, especially religious and political ones, aren't just funny differences between us. We don't just laugh them off and carry on with our day. They're passionate, intense disagreements that are deeply personal. All you have to do is look at social media for about two seconds, and you see everyone's opinions on all the latest issues. We see the political issues of the day, the religious issues of the day, plastered all over the place, and we figure out which side we agree with, and then argue against the other side. If you're around people for long, you can't help but brush up against these differences and try to navigate how to respond to people when we disagree. If you're like me, you often ask, is it better just to keep silent? Am I saying anything new to you today? Do you know this? Yes. My family and I, to this day, cannot talk about politics or religion 
because we disagree on some basic things, and for them it's a deep personal affront that I do not see things the way that they do. In fact, it hurt our relationship in serious ways that we are still, still dealing with. And even some of you today might be sitting, listening, trying to figure out if I'm on your side or one of them. <laughs> and the answer is, I root for Duke, so wherever that puts you and me, <laughs> just so you know. <laughs> but seriously, <laughs> what ends up happening is we, is we make all these things a part of our identity. We don't just say, I root for Duke, I root for UNC Hammond. <clears throat> Just kidding. <laughs> we say, I am a Duke fan. I am a UNC fan. I am a Republican. I am a Democrat. I'm a Chevy guy or I'm a Ford girl. It isn't just that I drive this kind of car or use this kind of computer, but I'm partly defined by these things, and the list goes on and on and on. We all have deep, passionate feelings about health care homosexuality, prayer in schools, flags, and so much more, and we begin to let those feelings define us. We get our identity from those things. We let all these differences define us, but do we ever stop to ask, how does saying I am a Christian color these things? Because there are Christian Republicans, and there are Christian Democrats, Christian Duke fans, and believe it or not, Christian UNC fans. <laughs> there are Christians on every side of every issue. So what do we do about that? The real problem is that all these different issues define us and then divide and separate us. Our scripture for today from Ephesians says this should not be the case. But let's start at the beginning of the passage. Paul reminds the church at Ephesus that by being Gentiles, they were once without Christ, aliens to the promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Whoa. These are shocking words, aren't they? They seem harsh. Paul's reminding Gentiles who are saved by the grace of Christ that there was once a time when they weren't a part of the promise, a time when they didn't have any hope, a time when they didn't have access to the covenant. How is this the message of hope to the Gentiles in Ephesus? What's Paul trying to do here? And we read these words today because they aren't just words for people 2,000 years ago but they're also words for us. We need to hear them, but the question is why? Why do we need to, remi to be reminded of a time when we were aliens to the promise? There's a deep divide between Jews and Gentiles, and all Gentiles were seen to be without hope, outside of the covenant of God. If you're familiar with the book of Acts, the early church is faced with the difficult question, should the Gentiles be included? Does the work of Christ make space for them over there? And if so, do they need to be circumcised? Do they need to follow the dietary laws as good faithful Jews did? There's a huge debate about if and how to incorporate these foreigners, these aliens, into the church. Let me just remind you that if you're not Jewish, like I'm not, then this is the story about how we became a part of the church. And though these may seem like small issues to us today, these questions were central to what it meant to be faithful to God, central to Jewish identity. But the leaders of the church in Jerusalem had to ask if they were central to Christian identity. In order to really dive into what's going on in this passage in Ephesians, we need to talk about how important and deeply embedded these differences are, because these are just like the divisions we face today in our church. In order to understand this, we need to talk about, our, we need to talk about circumcision. This was seen as something necessary for salvation by many Jewish Christians. They thought Gentiles should be required to undergo an operation of sorts if they were truly going to be Christ followers. Think about this. They were going to require adult converts to have this surgery 2,000 years ago, before anesthetics, before clean hospitals, if they wanted to be Christian. Isn't this crazy? This is, this is serious stuff. This is how serious it was because scripture requires it. There are many places in the Old Testament where it says it's necessary. For instance, in Genesis chapter 17, God's talking to Abraham about the promise and says that circumcision is a sign of the covenant and required of all males in the household, even slaves. And then says in verse 14, 
Anyone who is not circumcised will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Seems simple enough. That should be their answer. Early Jewish Christians knew this passage along with others that require a physical circumcision. In fact, Jesus himself was circumcised. So it seemed natural to think this was necessary if you were going to be a faithful Christ follower. The Bible says plain as day that this is an essential part of what it means to be in covenant with God. So many early Christians drew a line in the sand. They said this is necessary if you're going to be Christian. This is required to follow Christ. But again, doesn't this seem crazy to us now? But you and I, but are you and I so different? Do we sometimes hold our opinions so tightly and draw lines in the sand that we miss the work that God is doing right in front of our eyes? Paul knew about the requirements for circumcision in scripture. But he also knew that in Jesus, something entirely new was taking place. That Jesus is the start of a completely new identity, which includes all people. That what is taking place in Christ goes way further than that line of division. In Jesus, there is hope for everyone. Another main distinction between Jews and Gentiles was their eating practices. If you look in the book of Leviticus, you'll see all the strict rules about what can be eaten and what cannot what's clean, what's unclean. And it's because eating was a deeply intimate and sacred act. It involves taking life in order to sustain our own, giving thanks to God for provision, and sharing life with those around the table. It's deeply personal, and God was seen to be involved in each of these aspects. So in the early church, the question arose, what do we do about the Gentiles? Is there room at the table for people who don't follow Jewish law? They are unclean. They are different. Again, it's plain as day in scripture what is clean and what is unclean, and we don't want unclean people around our tables, do we? We don't want to be contaminated by them. This isn't a Jewish problem 2,000 years, isn't just a Jewish problem 2,000 years ago, though, is it? There are people today we want to be separate from people in our lives that we call unclean and don't want to be contaminated by. There are people we want to alienate from the promise. But in Acts, Peter is told by God not to call unclean what God has made, un- made clean, and then later told by the Spirit not to make a distinction between us and between them, between Jews and Gentiles. The Spirit commands the early Christians to make room for them, for the Gentiles, because in Christ something new is taking place. Christ changes how we see ourselves and how we see others. This is a huge shift. Both circumcision and eating practices were hard lines in scripture. They had to be followed. These were central parts of covenant with God. But Paul and Peter, led by the Spirit, said these are not essential parts of covenant with Christ. That Christ is doing something new, something that goes beyond the lines of division and separation that have been drawn. The shift is like saying, There's no Duke, no UNC. We're all just basketball fans in the state of North Carolina. It doesn't matter what shade of blue. But it's more than that. It's like saying there are no Republicans and no Democrats. The issues that separate us no longer matter. We're all just Americans. But it's way more than that. The differences between Jews and Gentiles are no longer the focus. Because according to Paul, our new identity is in Christ. We are reminded that we were once aliens to the promise, without hope, estranged, so that we might see that we are all included in the covenant by grace. This means I don't get to draw lines of division or say who's in or out because I'm here by the grace of God. Paul reminds the Ephesians and reminds us today that we are here by the grace of the Father, through the work of Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit, just like everyone else, so that we don't lose each other in our differences. The passage continues as Paul writes in verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you Gentiles who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ for he is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall that is the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself 
one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace, and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed, peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him, both of us have access to one, in one spirit to the Father. This is good news. And it's because of this that we are a part of the covenant. But it's also difficult news. Because that means so is everyone else. We're now challenged to allow for people to be different than us. Because according to Paul, our unity is found in Christ. So it doesn't have to be found in everything else. We who were once estranged from the promise have been included by the grace of God and are now made into one new humanity. The walls of division and hostility between us and whoever the them is for us have been broken down because we are in Christ and our identity is no longer in that which divides us, but it is in Christ which unites us. We were all aliens to the covenant, but now through the grace of God have been brought near. Paul reminds the Gentiles in Ephesus and reminds us today that it is only by the grace of God that we are saved. Because when we forget this, we allow divisions to reign in our lives rather than Christ. When we forget, when we forget this heritage of once being estranged, we find it much easier to estrange others, don't we? When we forget that it's by grace that we are saved, we forget to offer grace to others. When we forget that our identity is in Christ, we let all these other divisions in our world define us. So Paul reminds the Christians in Ephesus and reminds us today that we have been brought into the promise through the work of Christ by grace, and it is in him that we find our identity. There is no us and them. There is no one outside of the love of God, and we don't get to draw any lines of separation because we are only here by the grace and love of God which has been poured out on all people. Paul's reminding us who are quick to receive grace, but slow to extend it, that Christ is beyond the lines we draw on the sand. But more than that, through Christ, we are made into one new humanity. But let me just say, it's not easy to live with people who are different than us. They challenge us. But it isn't just those people that challenge us. If you're married or a part of a family, you know that's the case there as well. Being in real relationship with people is hard. It's so much easier to have our positions and our issues that we can argue with until we're blue in the face. It's so difficult to be in real relationship with one another. But that's what we're called to do in the church because of what Christ has done. As Paul finishes chapter 2 in Ephesians, he writes, so then you, no, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also built together spiritually, into a dwelling place for God. Mr. Rogers is credited with saying, Frankly, there isn't anyone you couldn't learn to love once you've heard their story. I want to repeat that. Frankly, there isn't anyone you couldn't learn to love once you've heard their story. It occurs to me that, we operate from our, that when we operate from our divisions, positions, issues, and arguments, in fact, this climate of division makes it difficult to hear much of anything at all. We become too busy trying to decide what's clean or unclean, or who can sit around our tables for fear of contamination, that we don't hear one another. We lose sight of one another, and our divisions become our distractions. And in all of this, we can miss what God is doing all around us. We need to listen to stories. We need to value those that are different than us, because they might have something to teach us. They just might show us new ways of living. In Charleston, South Carolina, our brothers and sisters showed what this looks like. A white male came into the church, sat through the meeting, and killed nine people deliberately. People targeted for the color of their skin in a church. 
This is a place that has deep historical significance. Thank you. Because church has been a place where African Americans have been able to assert their value and self-worth in Christ, despite the fact that society continues to degrade them. They know this reality infinitely more than I do. I've never worried about being targeted for the color of my skin. But that is a reality African Americans live in. The families of the Charles had every right to hate and to be filled with rage in the midst of incredible pain and hurt. They offer words of forgiveness. Can you imagine that? After losing your family member, having those words to share with the murderer, it seems crazy to us. which means we live and we operate in new ways. Christ changes how we see everything. The fact that we are all here by grace and the walls of division no longer separate us doesn't mean we stand you have for to nothing. Shake. But it means we stand oh, for different things. And you have things. to catch it in your hand. That's the... It means in living with each other, you can't when it's we pick up fall. our crosses daily. You have to hold your hand down here. We get the logs out of our eyes before we even try to think try to about our neighbor's respect. Yes. <laughs> the measure we use to judge others will be used on us. We offer forgiveness <laughs> seven, seven times Who big was that? We are a We strive to love That's the we feed the hungry. We are here to bring good news to the poor, release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. We're not just unified by grace, but we are empowered through Christ to live this way with one another. What if these were our platforms? What if these stances became our identity? Sure, I'll start so with you. <laughs> this morning I'm here to tell you that we have been formed into one new humanity through the work of Christ. We are being called beyond all of our division to remember our heritage of one's being estranged. We have been called to unity through grace so that we do not estrange others or let walls of division separate us. We have been called to proclaim the good news that we are all members of the household of God. We are called to be people of faith, redemption, forgiveness, hope, and love. We have been created as one new humanity, and that is what gives each of us our identity. What Paul is saying to us today is the identifier I am dot 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 that matters is I am in Christ. That is what allows us to love one another within our differences. This allows us to see that all the other people in Christ are different than we are and not be afraid. Because in Christ, we still find our unity. This is what it means to be one new humanity created in Christ. And that changes everything. Ma paix qui s'est 
Yeah. 